Hello, my name is Terrence Thomas. I'm a medical student at Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University, and I'll be bringing you through a high yield review of relevant orthopedic surgery anatomy using the Surgery Basics in 4D interactive app. We will first start with describing and defining important tissue structures. Let's begin with the long bones. In this example, we're looking at a femur. Long bones can be divided into three main components. The diaphysis, also known as the shaft, is the main section of the long bone. It is composed of cortical bone and typically will contain bone marrow and adipose tissue, or fat. Next is the metaphysis, which can be recognized as the widened portions of the long bones. This is the zone of the bone that sits between the growth plate and the diaphysis. It is important that we next recognize the growth plate, or physis, which is a translucent cartilaginous disc that sits between the epiphysis, or end of the long bone, and the previously mentioned metaphysis. The physis is responsible for the longitudinal growth of long bones as we develop, and is present in skeletally immature patients. Lastly, the epiphysis is the articular edge of the long bone, which typically holds a rounded surface. Let's move along and discuss an important cartilaginous structure within the knee, the meniscus. The meniscus is a tough C-shaped cartilage that serves as a pressure absorber between the femur and the tibia. We have a medial and lateral meniscus. The lateral meniscus is often more circular in shape, while the medial meniscus is more C-shaped. It should be noted that the medial meniscus is more commonly injured due to its close relationship with the medial collateral ligament, or MCL. Therefore, injury to the MCL will also often involve the medial meniscus. To quickly review some terminology here, tendons are structures that connect muscles to bones whereas ligaments connect bones to bones. An example of this is in the MCL or medial collateral ligament that we just discussed, which connects and provides support from the medial aspect of the distal femur to the proximal tibia. An example of a tendon would be the quadriceps tendon, which connects the quadriceps muscle to the patella or kneecap bone. The last tissues that we'll discuss are the rotator cuff muscles, which provide the shoulder with stability and motion. The rotator cuff is comprised of four muscles, often remembered using the mnemonic SITS, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. The supraspinatus is responsible for the elevation or abduction of the shoulder. The infraspinatus, and to a lesser extent, the teres minor, both play a role in external rotation of the shoulder. And lastly, the subscapularis is important for internal rotation of the shoulder. Moving on from the musculoskeletal tissue, we'll next discuss major nerves encountered during orthopedic surgery. We'll begin with the upper extremity and first discuss the radial nerve. Taking a look at this image here, we see that the radial nerve runs alongside the posterior aspect of the arm. If we take a look at our interactive brachial plexus model, we can see that the radial nerve comes off the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, covered in brown here, and receives contributions from the C5 to T1 nerve roots. It is responsible for innervation of the posterior aspect of the upper extremity, including the medial and lateral heads of the tricep brachii muscle. The radial nerve holds both sensory and motor functions. Its sensory functions involve providing sensory information to the dorsal aspect of the hand, including the web spaces between the fingers and the thumbs. Motor function of the radial nerve includes wrist extension. Patients with damage to the radial nerve, a common complication of humerus fractures, may classically present with wrist drop or an inability to properly extend their hand at the wrist. Next is the median nerve. From this image, we can see that unlike the radial nerve, the median nerve travels down the anterior surface of the arm, eventually traversing the carpal tunnel in the anterior wrist. If we take a look at our interactive brachial plexus model, we can see that the median nerve originates from the medial and lateral cords of the brachial plexus, colored in orange and purple in this image respectively. They then come together and form the median nerve and receive contributions from C5 to T1. Like the radial nerve, the median nerve also has both sensory and motor function. Sensory functions involve innervation of the palmar aspect of the hand, including the thumb, the index, middle, and radial half of the ring finger. Motor function involves innervation of the pronator teres and flexors of the forearm, allowing for the forearm to flex and pronate. Exceptions to this are the flexor carpi ulnaris and the flexor digitorum profundus, which receive their innervations from the ulnar nerve. Additional motor functions of the, of the median nerve include innervation to the first and second lumbricals and thenar muscles of the hand. A very common clinical finding associated with the median nerve is carpal tunnel syndrome, which results from inflammation of the carpal tunnel causing compression of the median nerve. Patients with carpal tunnel syndrome will present with numbness and tingling along the first three digits and radial half of the fourth digit, often occurring at night. Carpal tunnel syndrome is often diagnosed using patient history, physical exam, and nerve conduction studies. 
Conservative treatment for patients with milder symptoms involves wrist splinting and immobilization at night. Surgical candidates may undergo a surgical decompression of the carpal tunnel to relieve pressure off the median nerve. The third nerve of the upper extremity that we'll cover is the ulnar nerve, which originates from the medial cord of the brachial plexus, receiving contributions from C8 to T1. The ulnar nerve runs alongside the medial aspect of the upper extremity. Like the radial and median nerves, it provides sensory and motor functions to the upper extremity. Sensory function involves innervation to the fifth digit, ulnar aspects of the fourth digit, and ulnar aspects of the palm. Motor functions involve the intrinsic muscles of the hand, including the third and fourth lumbricals, dorsal and palmar interossei, and hypothenar muscle of the ulnar side of the palm. The last nerve of the upper extremity we'll discuss is the axillary nerve, which branches from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus and receives contributions from C5 and C6. It is important due to its innervation to the shoulder, specifically the deltoid muscle, teres minor, and triceps brachii. Moving along, we'll highlight two high-yield nervous structures of the lower extremity. First is the femoral nerve, which receives contributions from L2 to L4 of the lumbar plexus. This is the largest branch of the lumbar plexus and travels deep to the inguinal ligament to reach the thigh. The femoral nerve is responsible for innervation to the anterior leg. Sensory function of the femoral nerve include anterior cutaneous branches of the femoral nerve, which provide sensory information to the thigh. Motor functions involve innervation to the quadriceps femoris and iliacus muscles. Secondly, the sciatic nerve, the largest nerve in humans, will receive its contributions from L4 to S3 and travel under the piriformis muscle and through the great sciatic foramen as it runs along and supplies innervations to the posterior leg. At the popliteal fossa, the sciatic nerve will divide into the tibial nerve running posteriorly and common peroneal nerve running anteriorly. The sciatic nerve innervates the flexor muscles of the thigh and the calf. A key clinical finding from impingement or damage to this nerve is sciatica, which will cause patients to have pain from their lower back along the posterior aspects of one or both legs. With that, that is the end of our high yield orthopedic surgery anatomy review. Thank you for your attention.